Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 58th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, uh, hosted by the Strategic Innovation Lab at OCAD University. Uh, my name is Anthony Upward, and uh, I need to tell you that if you do not wish to be recorded, because we are recording today's meeting, you should leave now. Uh, I am delighted this month uh, to have as our speaker, uh, or we are delighted to have as our speaker this month, Lorraine Smith, uh, uh, Associate Director from Volans, and she will say more about herself and her organization uh, shortly. Uh, I have been taking attendance, uh, which is in the wiki page, uh, which is in the chat, uh, the link to the wiki page is in the chat, uh, the very first item in the chat. If uh, you don't like your affiliation in there, please let me know what I should have and we can take it from there. Okay, Lorraine, the floor is yours. Welcome. Right. Thank you very much. What a delight to be here. And uh, thank you, Anthony, for setting us up, Bob, for, Bob Willard, for encouraging me to be here. I think I'm now on camera, yes, uh, waving to those. What just happened there? <laughs> What would a webinar be without just a moment of technical uh, adjustment? I think we're, we're still on, yeah? Yes, I think so. Great. So um, what I thought I'd do over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is spend a little bit of time introducing some of the ideas that we've been exploring at Willands. Uh, but I do plan to take questions at that point and then launch into a slightly different theme and pause again. So I just wanted to set expectations that I have a few uh, blocks of remarks set up and some logical pausing points. But having said that, I also have every intention of uh, fielding questions. And I can actually see a screen here, given the amazing uh, technical wizardry. So I'll see questions coming in. And if it makes sense to pause at a certain point uh, unscripted, I will certainly do that. Um, but why don't I just take a moment to highlight what I think we'll be covering today, unless others want to steer me into other directions. Um, very briefly, I'll set some objectives and introduce myself and a bit more about uh, the hat I'm wearing today. And then I'd like to set some context. Uh, I think the subject matter we're covering here, breakthrough business models, is a pretty broad and ambitious one. And I think it's worth placing that content into some context for you. And perhaps you'll challenge back and, and offer additional points of view on that as well. And um, I, I just wanted to highlight context means a few things. So at that sort of macro level, just making sure we're taking a systems approach uh, to the thinking here. And I can highlight what I mean by that. Um, and then also some context in terms of where are we on this journey and, and what would be relevant to consider as we think about breakthrough business models. Um, I did want to share some highlights and examples from uh, a research report that I was uh, co-author of. You can see a picture of it here. As we go through the slides, I'll be highlighting content and links. This is all online, uh, freely available, and the links are embedded in this uh, presentation, which I believe is made available afterwards. Yeah. So, and if there's any uh, missing pieces or people want more, you can always check in with me. So, I will be spending uh, hopefully a a worthy bit of time on some of the key findings from the report that we've got here to explore. And uh, from there, I also just wanted to make sure we're uh, thinking a little bit about where do we go from here? You know, we're, we've checked in on where we are now and some of the key findings, uh, but I do think it's interesting to provoke and prod a little bit about uh, where next. And uh, that really is a few ideas for me, but hopefully many more from many of you. And, and so that'll lead me here to our objectives. And I've, I've got three. Uh, some are much easier than others. The, the easy one is for me to share with you the latest on some of the thinking coming out of Volans on breakthrough business models. And by easy, I mean it's fairly straightforward to give you some of the key messages and the findings in this report. Uh, not quite as easy to apply them. And so from there, I'd say um, one of the other objectives I have is to provoke ideas for contributing system value. And hopefully that's a term that some of you recognize. I know Bob Willard definitely will, and I believe last month your presenter or presenters were from the Future Fit Business Benchmark. And I'm willing to bet they give you a good appetite wetting around the concept of system value. I'm going to be applying some of that thinking here with you today. And so my objective is also just to provoke you to think about what system value are you bringing? We're all people, and hopefully we're contributing here. 
Um, a very selfish objective on my part is to hear your feedback. You know, what's making sense here? What's not? Where would you like to hear more information? Uh, where do you see things differently? So I would really value your uh, input and challenges and ideas. Um, that latter one, as far as I understand with the technology, that can be ongoing. I can see um, uh, lines of questioning coming in on the side here. So by all means, keep that coming. If there's one thing I hope you leave this presentation with, it's at least some ideas, uh, maybe validation, maybe new, different uh, challenge on what your role is in the next wave of business. And that could be really specific, it could be pretty broad, but I really hope that you leave with some new, uh, new thinking, new ideas on your role and where we go from here. Uh, I promised quick introductions. Uh, this is not me. This is, of course, John Elkington, and I think many of you uh, will recognize him, and I know a few of you have had a chance to work directly with him. So John Elkington is the founder of Bullands, and that's the organization whose work I'm here to present today. And Bullands, for those of you not familiar, it's easy to find, and there's a link on this page along with a couple others, bullands.com. It's a small shop headquartered in uh, London, uh, in London, UK, of course, one specifies here in Ontario. Um, and they are really a catalyst for breakthrough. And that's a pretty forward thinking idea, so I'm hoping it makes sense to you by the end of this conversation. Um, hopefully, it already sparks a few ideas. A few very specific things taking place coming out of the Bullands shop. Um, they, we are leading the uh, Project Breakthrough initiative with the UN Global Compact. And if you search the hashtag Project Breakthrough, and uh, you'll see some pretty interesting stuff coming up on Twitter, some amazing links. I'll make a few references to that in a couple places. And then we're also deep in the trenches on uh, an initiative called uh, Carbon Productivity. That's the technical hashtag. We're going to see some interesting messaging coming out of that. Um, this is a consortium uh, headed up by a chemical company actually called Covestro, but it's far beyond the chemicals industry and it's getting quite interesting. So again, uh, an early phase hashtag on carbon productivity. Those are just two of the bigger stories coming out of Bolands at the moment. Um, and I mentioned that's the hat I'm here wearing. Some of you may have bumped into me wearing a slightly different hat or two. Um, so I'll just quickly clarify. Um, I am an independent consultant. I work as an associate director with Bolands, and I co-authored the work that I'm here to present to you today. I co-authored it in collaboration with John Elkington and Jacqueline Lim. Uh, I also continue as an associate with Sustainability, which is a boutique consultancy founded originally by John Elkington, uh, now uh, headed up by a fellow named Rob Cameron out of London, and uh, another fellow Canadian named Mark Lee out of uh, the west coast of the US. And I, I work in-house with them for a number of years, and I continue to collaborate with that team. I'm a member of uh, CBSR, Canadian, uh, sorry, I'm a board member of CBSR, Canadian Business for Social Responsibility. And in case you missed my tweet, this just in, they are actively seeking a new leader for the organization. It's a really exciting opportunity and a very exciting time. So if you're interested in that, uh, please reach out. I think it's going to be a great thing. And as a board member, I'm excited about the future there. I'm also a release council member of the uh, Future Fit Business Benchmark. Apologies that business benchmark got cut off there. Uh, again, some of you are familiar. So uh, I wear a few hats, and that makes me um, uh, kind of energized on a number of topics, in particular, certainly business model innovation. I'd say my overall common thread is a belief that we can fulfill much more potential than we're currently fulfilling. I think business has an incredible purpose and, and role within society, and we as individuals have an opportunity to really help fulfill that purpose. And, and that's really part of being a, a, a piece within a larger whole, a sort of thriving web of life, if you will. And, and I think much of my work really connects to that. I feel pretty excited to uh, get to do what I do. Um, somewhere along the way, it was noted that I'm uh, from New York, which is true. I live there now. I am Canadian, uh, and I love coming back to Toronto. So I'm delighted for this excuse. With that brief intro, I'm now going to jump into context setting. And for those of you who will know and maybe even remember uh, from real time uh, the work of Buckminster Fuller, you might rec uh, recognize the reference to this geodesic structure. And therefore, you might be familiar with one of my favorite concepts and quotes. And this will lead us into a little bit of systems thinking. 
And this is around the concept that you really don't change things by fighting the existing reality. Tempting as it is, a lot of teeth gnashing that I myself may partake in from time to time, we will change things by building a new model that makes the old one obsolete. And that really permeates the, the thinking around business model innovation. It's easy to talk about, easy to say, challenging to do, and in my humble opinion, absolutely essential. I, I'm, I'll, I'm happy to take questions about, uh, thank you, I'm being uh, corrected, the de dodecahedron. Uh, all systems are polyhedral. Good, I love this. Keep, keep it coming. There's probably folks who run circles around my uh, bucking knowledge, as they say. Uh, but I do greatly appreciate the, um, the principle behind stopping the fight of the existing reality of this doesn't work, pointing out broken things, and shifting that energy towards building functional things, building things that work, that thrive, that bring about the benefits that we seek. Um, there's a lot we can talk about with systems thinking, and, and I'm happy to go there if people do want to go there, so throw questions my way. But I wasn't going to go into the sort of hierarchy of places to intervene in a system and some of the Danella Meadows thinking that's out there, which I think is brilliant and, and useful. Instead, what I thought I would do is point to some of the places where we actively see systems thinking playing in. Because one of the things that concerns me is we talk a lot about the need to think in systems. And I think we sometimes get muddled up in, oh no, you know, I don't have systems thinking training or um, systems are really complicated, and, and I'm, I'm not doing systems right now, I'm doing this other thing. And I'd like to encourage people to, um, to re realize that systems thinking is actually a key part of many, many, many fields. So, for example, and these little images are meant to trigger some of them, uh, the tree hugger there is meant to imply deep ecology, which is in and of itself a field, it's a scholarship, you know, it's an area of scholarship, you can go quite deep there you realize with deep ecology, you're really looking at the interaction of living systems and how life evolves, how we understand the ecological realities around us. That's a form of system thinking. Uh, right beside it, we've got a sort of organizational diagram. Organizational development, organizational design. We, uh, we were chatting a bit about this ahead of the conversation. The way in which organizations function the purpose that they serve, how they interact with other elements of society, that's systems in action. And if you're thinking about that, chances are you're applying some elements of systems thinking. Biomimicry, you know, that chair imitating some of the um, uh, designs found in nature. Biomimicry is an application of systems thinking in some way, shape, or form, whether you realize it or not. The circular economy is in many ways, or, or, or circular design or closed loop thinking, is again another form of thinking about how different elements that are connected within a system can interact with one another to serve a given purpose. Urban planning, in many ways, is systems thinking, planning out how do elements of a system interact with one another to serve a given purpose. Uh, psychology, neuropsychology, some of the deeper places we could go digging in psychology again, can be considered a form of system thinking. Understanding how different elements, in this case the neurons in our brains, and perhaps other things, external, um, external inputs, nutrition, sleep, other aspects of a given system interact with one another to fulfill a purpose. You'll notice I've used a couple pieces of vocabulary pretty frequently there. Interactions between elements to fulfill a purpose. That's really all there is to a system. I think it's important, a couple things I'll hover on the systems thinking, um, to recognize that systems that are run by people, things like schools, governments, companies, uh, we might typically describe them as having a purpose. That's a thing we hopefully thought about and decided on. Hopefully we also agree on it, maybe not. Um, other systems that are not run by humans, so things like uh, my kidney, um, the solar system, you know, things that are just occurring the way nature has designed them, uh, might be described as having a function. So we don't necessarily get to choose the purpose of my kidney, rather it serves a function, we hope. Interestingly, I'm just going to put out there to, to uh, ponder a little further, I think we have um, a bit of blur going on in terms of whether society is a system run by people making decisions about our purpose, 
or whether we're actually a little bit more designed by nature and we have a function. I'll just throw that out there. I'm not 100% sure, and sometimes I wonder. Um, so I'm just reminding us here to take a systems approach because here we are moving into uh, what is often referred to as a great acceleration. Some of you have probably seen these hockey stick uh, charts before in some way, shape, or form. It's probably a little bit difficult to read the words here. Um, I'm going to do a quick orientation, not take us through all of the data. And if you're interested in more on this, this is on the Stockholm Resilience um, web page, which is linked here and is also well known for having uh, published really useful open source data on the planetary boundaries. And what I find really useful here is this quick snapshot of different data points that highlight a fairly recent acceleration or dramatic change in certain things that are uh, of relevance to society. So the, the horizontal axis is time, and, and all of them are representing time. And then uh, what's happening on the vertical will be different things. So the, the top left is simply population. That's probably not a big headline. I'm guessing some of you are aware that the population has increased um, and is pointed upwards. Uh, towards the sort of the second from the bottom rung, uh, third one in, is the number of McDonald's restaurants. Again, you, you probably knew there weren't any 100 years ago or so. And you're probably aware that there are more now. Um, but when you start to put some of these numbers in context and view them in concert with one another, it starts to highlight the number of dynamic things shifting. And I think this is useful. Um, in my imagination, I like to plot some of the graphs that aren't here. For example, how many professionals now apply systems thinking in their day-to-day -day work? Probably also an accelerated curve. <coughs> than what we would have seen in the past. How many professionals or other people going about their day to day think about their impacts on the environment or society in, in new and different ways? Again, this is a dynamic space. I'm noticing a lot more of this going on. How many investments are being earmarked for social and or environmental impact in one way, shape, or form? So in a way, this causes me some despair. More than anything, this causes me to recognize the dynamics and the important uh, fluidity of a lot of what's going on, including some really positive and exciting things. So continuing on the context setting then with our systems lens, uh, you know, we have this great acceleration. How is the world responding? Uh, I'm fairly sure most of you are familiar with the uh, sustainable development goals. And, and are seeing some of this taking shape within the corporate context, within the international context, um, often referred to as the global goals. And um, we're seeing many companies starting to react quite actively with these. I'm going to touch a bit more on what I mean by this in a little bit. Um, but I think this is an exciting opportunity for business, although I can unpick it more and, and explain why it's, it's exciting, but it's also a little bit frenetic. But I would say this is a response. This is a sort of collective response to those hockey sticks we just looked at, those uh, upward curves on all that data. Um, we can also look at the context in another way. And this is a graphic that's in the report. Again, the, the link is here, and it's probably a little bit difficult to digest on screen. But that's OK, because the real message here is a pretty broad stroke or two that I'll, I'll walk you through. And, and so this is, again, in context setting. One of the things, if you've had a chance to hear Don Elkington speak, I'm going to bet you noticed he likes to describe waves. And if you've read any of his past reports, he often uh, likes to notice these sort of wave patterns that are happening. And, and this is something you see in a lot of other scholarship as well. Uh, certainly, uh, and, and, and this, it's referenced here, it's probably a little bit tricky to see, um, but the blue line, so the dark blue line that kind of runs through the middle, is reflecting what are sometimes referred to as chondrative or chondrative, depending on your pronunciation, uh, waves. And those are observations of economic patterns that have played out. And in particular, they've been punctuated by particular um, circumstances in society. So the Great Panic of 1857, the Long Depression that, that in theory, began in the uh, sort of mid-1870s. Again, the Great Depression in, in the last century. And then looking at some of the um, other economic blips in more recent time, the oil crisis, for example, and the financial crisis of the uh, 2008 period. 
in each of those sort of waves, these seemingly long waves, depending on your uh, geological time horizons, there have been some common patterns. And what some have observed, and, and uh, John writes up in some detail in the uh, introductory section of the report, and I, although I'm a co-author, I give him full credit on really driving some of the thinking around this, is that it's important to recognize these waves, these cycles, because they seem to play in. They seem to be real and quite meaningful in terms of some of the dynamics and the disruptions that can happen in society. And with that wave pattern in mind, it's important to note that it looks as though we're ending one and beginning another. That in and of itself would just be interesting. If you're a business person, you're planning long-term strategy, you're looking for opportunities, you're assessing risks, it's already meaningful to take that pattern into account. There are two very other important reasons that really set the stage for what we're trying to explore in the, um, in the Breakthrough Business Models Report. The first one, I'll draw your attention to the red line across the top. And that really touches on the full arc of the, you could call it different things, but let's call it for shorthand, the make-take-waste paradigm. That's the sort of arc of more or less industry as we know it. We're going to take those raw materials, we're going to use them up, and then we're done. Heat, beat, and treat is another way you hear it sometimes referred to. There have, of course, been shifts in that, and not every business takes that paradigm uh, for granted, but it's a fairly common circumstance. So that line really overarches all of those long wave cycles that Conrad and others had noticed. The other one that I take to heart, and perhaps others in the room will as well, if you've spent time in the so-called sustainability field or industry, um, the yellow sort of blippy arc making its way, or yellow or orange depending on your screen, um, which is a much shorter one, this is really the timeline in which the sustainability movement or the sustainable development movement has begun and grown up to be what it is today. And this is, I think, quite critical for us to notice because it means we've really existed only within one paradigm. And again, if you go into Meadows and some of the systems thinking work there, you'll soon see that one of the highest leverage points, one of the most critical things to shift if you're trying to adapt a system is at that paradigm level. And this, I take, is a very sincere call to action to those of us in this field to recognize we've grown up in one paradigm. We are probably about to move into another, whether we are in it or not. And, and that's a little bit unsettling. And, and I've actually seen it play out in very specific places, and if we have time, I'm happy to share um, some of the bits and pieces there. So, um, that, uh, just in case you're wondering about the affiliation of a Christopher who's joining, mm -hmm. that's my charming husband, Diane, uh, from New York. Okay. Welcome, darling. Checking up on you. That's right. Oh, it's any comfort we met in the context of sustainability, so <laughs> he's, he's, he's good. Uh, he's, good he's good. Yeah, okay. he's good. He's one of us. Hello, Christopher. Exactly. <laughs> Cheers. Um, so all to say, this is a bit of context setting. I think uh, just to quickly recap, it's about applying a systems lens as we go through any of these processes and any of our day-to-day, -day, regardless of our field. Uh, it's about recognizing some of those hockey stick curves and the dynamic activity in many of some of the most critical societal and uh, environmental systems, seeing how the world is responding with things like the SDGs, but nonetheless keeping that paradigm concept, insight, and recognizing things are unfolding around us and we need to be mindful that we don't have all the answers and that things are going to be quite dynamic. So um, just before I go into taking a look at some of the um, uh, key findings from the business model report that I'll share, I'm, I'm just going to blather for a brief moment in case anybody wanted to type in a question or if microphones get people. Have microphones. Yes, they should. They should work, but sometimes people prefer to type anyway. To type anyway, and do feel free to do that. So I did just want to pause a bit and see if there were any questions. And there is definitely one here in the room. And then keep typing if folks wanted to dive in with anything else, please. So Melinda, uh, I heard you say that there's common themes in, in the ways, mm -hmm. 
and the note taker and was like, okay, I'm listening for them, and I didn't hear anything. Ah, gosh, okay, that's, yeah, good, good call. So I think the, I, I, I skimmed a little because it's pretty detailed to go into some of the characteristics, but let me, let me see if I can simplify and, and not gloss over too much. Um, for example, the most recent wave, if you were to sort of plot between the sort of mid to late 70s to the, um, the financial pickup, if you will, in 2008, one of the biggest shifts that was happening, and, and by the way, with the slide I have up right now, um, the pale bars that, that are, there's lots and lots of those bars that sort of go up and down and look like a bit of a, an increasing heartbeat. Um, those represent the uh, earnings uh, as listed in the S&P 500. So those are essentially stock numbers, if you will. So what's happening in that most recent way is really uh, a lot of technology and shifts in what's possible for businesses around the world. The globalization, um, the shift towards more global companies, so the aggregation of a number of the biggest companies across some of the biggest industries. Um, obviously in the more recent years, the, the concept of the developing economy started to play an increasing role across the global economy, which is also part of that bigger bowl talk happening in, the, um, in that last wave in the financial numbers. Whereas if you were to compare the existing technologies, and by the way, I should say, um, we had a lot of debate on how much we wanted to compare apples to apples. Like, should we take technologies and say what was possible in 2000 that wasn't possible in 1970 that wasn't, you know, go back. And, and you can do some of that. It's not quite as tidy as, you know, let's look at how power was generated. Let's look at how people were educated. Uh, but you can then go to the previous wave and say people were operating within very different economic conditions at that time. So the way a lot of businesses were structured, the size of the average publicly traded company, um, the typical time horizon in jobs <coughs> for other people, productivity levels, you start to see sort of clusters of characteristics. And if you go back even further, you know, again, you can sort of recluster those characteristics. I heard you glazed over them because it's almost like a whole other conversation okay. in itself. I, I don't mean to glaze over and say it's not important. We have one hand raised and one question. I'll take the question first. Stephen uh, wanted to know if there's a, a significant downward curve on the mm -hmm. red line. What do you ascribe that to? Yeah, uh, to a subjective observation that it's our sense, and of course it, it ends in the present, so we don't really know the future, um, it turns out. But to a subjective sense that the current paradigm would take, make, waste, uh, the heat, beat, and treat, really is not sustainable. It's just, it's not a plane that can keep flying, right? And to quote, uh, or to probably botch, but hopefully paraphrase, a book that Bob Willard, you recommended, and I'm two-thirds of the way through, and as you read, you suggested, it's totally changing my worldview, Ishmael, um, where you, you know, you can have a plane that you shove off a cliff that doesn't follow the laws of aerodynamics, and it might fly for a while, um, but it will crash if it's not following the laws of aerodynamics. And the current paradigm, that red line, if you will, uh, is not heeding basic fundamental laws, if you will, call them planetary boundaries, call them understanding the principles of the web of life. You can sort of articulate it in any number of ways. Um, it doesn't follow. And so, it will crash, I think is the way to put it. Um, I, I hope that answers the question and the significance is, and we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between breakthrough and breakdown. The difference is, you know, uh, or the question is, what do we do about it? You know, how do we re-articulate the way in which business functions to deliver on society's needs? And you'll notice um, the red line ends and the yellow line ends, because that's sort of where we are now. We're not sure what's next, but we're questioning that next wave. Uh, so to your question a moment ago of, you know, what are the characteristics? Well, what are the characteristics of this next wave? We hope that they are breakthrough, and I'll talk a bit more about that in, in just a moment. Uh, we hope that they're breakthrough. We hope they deliver on society's needs and, and within planetary boundaries. We are confident that there are really good solutions out there, both in terms of the technology, the will, uh, the capital, and, and many of the other things required. We acknowledge 
as per the black line <laughs> that goes in a direction we'd rather not go, that um, that may not be the case, right? And, and that would be quite probably a very disruptive uh, line in the graph if anyone is able to graph it down the line. Um, and that, that that's sort of what we call breakdown. And, that, and I can talk a bit more to some of the specifics on that, which is exactly where the, the findings of the report go. Uh, yes, uh, Peter, you have your hand up. You, uh, I assume it's because you're going to speak to us rather than type. Hi, it's Peter Jones. Uh, I also teach at OCAD's uh, Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you can. Terrific, yep. Great. Um, let's see, so uh, I'd recommend uh, 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 reading uh, Paul Mason's Post Capitalism with respect to you know this uh, the current situation we're talking about. He has um, Fantastic treatment of uh, of, of Condratif in his first uh, first few chapters, where he relates it to uh, the Condratif winter that is in the process of kind of of, of um, ending um, now, and it may be another ten years or so. His proposal is that we will see, you know, a period, a huge period of opportunity, which he's calling post-capitalism, where uh, uh, Condratif, who was sent to uh, the gulag um, and 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 basically uh, taken out of his his scholarly post for predicting the end of socialism also predicted the end of capitalism uh, with you know with these with these formal models and even though they don't track to necessarily our social realities the more that our social social realities can speak to um, these kind of credit trend you know these these changes in credit formation that happened. Uh, Paul Mason is suggesting from, from quite a bit of research pointing to the same, you know, uh, uh, the same opportunity, if you will, that a, a crisis in the formation of global capitalism is, is really upon us now. And over the next 10 years, uh, you know, completely new forms of economic organization, you know, may, may come out. So that will be, you know, during the crisis, of course, you know, existing stakeholders will be uh, desperate to maintain control. But it's good for us to, in, you know, in terms of thinking about um, flourishing systemic um, business models that could survive this type of complete change in, 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 uh, in economic order, we might uh, consider that, you know, even though this isn't a, a precise change, it does point to possibly a significant alteration in the way that uh, economic order is structured. And if that were the case, some of our near-term business models might look to be transformable um, as, as an economic paradigm itself changes to uh, circular economies, more local or distributed economies, uh, the use of, of technology to transform work where more people are actually given a guaranteed basic income and, you know, as which would be contra to today's capitalism, but is one of Paul Mason's um, uh, major proposals. And so there are really, I think, a lot of other fellow travelers uh, in macro thinking that, that may be supporting the directions that we may be going, but we might be also really sensitive to you know, how this might feel on the ground, that a lot of smaller businesses aren't going to be able to sustain that type of, of paradigmatic collapse and so uh, business models, in terms of breakthrough business models, um, even if they're oriented toward the future, need to be cognizant that types of capital may shift dramatic, you know, forms of capital and the way they're structured may shift uh, radically over the next five and 10 years. Peter, could you just put the uh, reference uh, to that book in the chat for everybody? Yeah, Paul Mason's Post Capitalism. Paul Mason's Post Capitalism? Yes, yes, the BBC uh, reporter who was you know on the front lines of the 2008 collapse and has been kind of working on that ever since. But yeah, yeah. I'll type the book so others can see it. Okay, thanks, Peter. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. And uh, you and John are definitely birds of a feather. And uh, that book and very specific uh, passages of that were a, were a heavy reference in our conversations. And I think. Um, yeah, it's great to hear you bring that up and uh, encourage folks to dive 
a little deeper. I think one of the things that really stood out for me is the just the reference that you know you can come at this conversation from a lot of different angles, uh, but certainly there's a lot of solid economic thinking out there that supports you know significant changes are happening whether we're making adjustments to our business models or not. And a number of the characteristics that you just described, Peter, I think are, are very aligned with what we explore a little deeper in the report. So, so maybe I'll take that as a good segue to just sneak a little bit uh, into the pages of the report. And I just wanted to signal here, you know, in case you were hoping for a really big reveal, like John and Jack who, who wrote this, that we've come up with this like hidden universe of business model ideas that nobody else has heard of and we're going to share it with you now. Um, alas, it turns out many of you are probably quite familiar with much of what's already in here. And what we've discovered is there's lots of amazing stuff already underway. There's characteristics that we can um, provide and frame, and I'll try to do some of that for you now. But the way I like to think of this is it's almost like playing a chord. You know, there are different notes, and there may be one note within the chord that's stronger than the other. Um, and, and if you understand how those notes come together to form a solid sound, you can really create something powerful or, or even beautiful. Um, and to go one step further with the music metaphor, um, one of the things I was finding as we were going through this, I mentioned off the top I, I used to work in-house and I still collaborate quite a bit with sustainability. Um, and they, I believe actually they've been a guest of yours as well, Lindsay Clinton and some of the uh, model behavior, business model innovation work there. And, and I collaborated with Lindsay and team on that a while back. One starts to see uh, some common patterns in terms of the challenges, the things we're not figuring in, the same answers we're all coming to. And so back to the music, I realized in some ways it's like taking a song that you love and, and hearing it be covered by another band, where all of a sudden you hear things in the chorus or something about the cadence of it. Oh, that's what this song is about. And so I tell you that because, um, probably because I, I'm maybe feeling like you'll be disappointed that there isn't a major reveal here. There isn't a magical business model. But also to give you permission to see things you've seen before in new and different ways, which I think is part of what we will need to break through. Um, Peter, you, you were alluding to something that I think is quite important and that we bumped into many times, which is, you know, you've got these incumbent businesses. Some of them are massive. They're multi-billion dollar businesses. No matter what really cool ideas about breakthrough we come up with, no matter what we think of the contrary of waves, they're not going to overhaul their business models on Tuesday, right? Like, it's just not what they're having meetings about right now. So we need to bear in mind what's going on with some of the major incumbents. We need to look for places for what we can build today that will have an impact down the line. And then we also need to look for those spaces in between. And each of us is probably in a slightly or dramatically different role in terms of our ability to carry that out. And that was to my prov provoking question off the start, what, what's your role in this next wave? And I think it's going to be different. On that note, I'll, I'll share some highlights of the characteristics of breakthrough business models that we saw. We, we were continually inspired by uh, the Buckminster Fuller, Fuller uh, geometry of it all. And, and the first uh, attribute that we saw in some of the business models that struck us as breakthrough or, or inching towards breakthrough is this element of being social. And, and social doesn't just mean nice for people. Uh, it means that it's really delivering positive impacts by its value, value creation model, and these are positive impacts for people. And I want to touch on a little bit what that is, and especially what it isn't, because uh, you know, pretty much every business will say, we, you know, we have a wonderful impact on all kinds of great things, and maybe they do, uh, but maybe they don't. So one of my favorite, and, and pretty much everything I'm going to mention here is uh, referenced in the report. I'll let you know when it's not. Um, so if you're looking for more information on this, you can go into the report, search on the keyword, and you'll get more details, links, examples, etc. So I'm just going to give kind of tasters here uh, rather than hovering too long. Um, but uh, again, we've got great resources in this room virtually and beyond in that uh, the B Corp movement and the B Corp certification aspects that we're seeing unfolding out there came up again and again in our research around looking for those business models where um, companies were intentionally creating social value in, uh, in proactive ways that are baked right into their business models. There may be different models that they're applying, different ways of creating and transacting value. Uh, companies we saw that really caught our eye probably uh, already on your radar 
a company like Natura, the large Brazilian cosmetics company that actively engages with its supply chain, many of whom are women, uh, many of whom are in rural communities and are engaging with parts of their communities who would not otherwise have direct financial access. And Natura, and I've actually spent time and lived in Brazil um, a long ago and then have returned under uh, several occasions in, uh, in a professional capacity. And so I've had a chance to kind of see Natura from a few angles and continue to be impressed by their very embedded approach to uh, really delivering social value by creating financial value. There's, there's lots of examples we could talk about that. I'm curious if some of you know of others that you say, you know, this company really exists to deliver social value. I note it as a characteristic or one of the notes in the chord of the breakthrough, if you will, that we think will need to be played. I want to emphasize what it isn't because we often, you know, you, you may be seeing some of the same reports I do where companies put in their sustainability report, they reference the sustainable development goals, you know, this is how we're creating the future we want, uh, you know, and they start to pick out some of the goals and say what they're doing against them. Okay, and, and quite possibly some of that's quite real and, and very impactful. Um, but sometimes it just doesn't always stand up. So I think of, for example, the movement uh, within the tobacco industry. There's quite a bit of innovation going on around e-cigarettes. And the uh, dialogue there and, and a lot of the data, uh, which I believe, you know, you can fact check it. I think it's probably true data, will illustrate how these products and these innovations are reducing harm. So they are, you know, reducing health-related incidents uh, that, that are caused by tobacco. And I, I do believe that that's true, and I think reducing harm is probably a good thing. However, the way in which the company delivers financial value, so this is fundamental to its business model, is by selling an addictive single-use product. So let's not make the mistake of thinking that's a somehow breakthrough business model. It's an innovation. It may do less harm than the original, uh, but in, in my humble opinion, that, that is not breakthrough. That's just less harm. And at one of the things I love about the Future Fit Business Benchmark, which I referenced off the top, uh, and, and others in the room know it quite well as well, it's, it highlights in an open source and collaborative way that where we need to be as future businesses and, and citizens is not less bad. It's good, right? That's what flourishing is all about. So keeping that social delivery device in mind as the way in which the company creates value. And we will see evolution towards this if we get this right. I'm going to skim through these pretty quickly. There's lots of examples in the report, and I'm hoping some of you will also have um, some good examples. I'm just sort of cherry-picking pieces of the characteristics. Uh, one of the next characteristics that we saw, uh, by the way, I didn't touch on the acronym at the beginning, but SLICE, so we're going to go through S, L, I, C, and E, so social, we touched on, lean. And this one will sound familiar, but I'm going to put a little twist on it for you. So we anticipate that if we get this right, if we see breakthrough business models really uh, thriving and becoming more and more successful, they will be lean, which means they will optimize the use of all forms of capital. And we, we see companies doing this, right? They're good at uh, minimizing resources, reducing waste, all that good stuff. Absolutely, that fits within lean. Uh, we were joking before the conversation, uh, a couple of us around, you know, the lean startup, that's a... You know, that's almost a paraphrasing for just being frugal and, and getting things done well. And there are more breakthrough ways of looking at lean. So an example we talk about in the report, and, and you can have a closer look if you're interested, is a really interesting business model that's emerged in Pakistan. The company is called Doctors. So Doct, as in the beginning of doctor, but instead of the O-R at the end, it's HERS, H-E-R-S. And again, written up in the report, and what's amazing about this business model is it recognizes that it's a fairly common situation for female medical doctors in Pakistan to uh, stop practicing after they get married and have children. And that happens in other parts of the world as well, uh, but it's particularly uh, being called out as a, essentially a loss of an incredibly valuable resource in uh, Pakistan, and so one woman, um, an MD, bless you, who was experiencing this herself, realized that here is this amazing resource, this pool of knowledge and expertise and ability that still has some capacity to deliver on that and some interest and will, and yet it's sort of locked up in doing other stuff. How do I lock that resource and really deliver it in a way that brings value and, and also touches on that social note in the court as well. 
And so Doctors was started to connect women who had stopped practicing through remote medical um, technology with communities where there are women patients who lack effective and efficient access to medical doctors, either just because of a lack of access or because of a preference or a need to be treated and, and consulted with uh, by a female doctor. And so it's sort of touching on a number of needs and deploying an existing resource in a way that, from our perspective, when we think about breakthrough, really, uh, really values resources in an intelligent and lean way. So we encourage you, when you think about breakthrough, to go beyond that sort of, you know, am I just cutting stuff away and letting it fall, and starting to think about what are the intellectual resources here? What are the physical and natural and human and, and all the ways, even manufacturing resources, that might be misunderstood or, or underutilized and, and that we could uh, build out further. That's one of the characteristics that we see of breakthrough. Another one, this one's coming up in all angles. I'd be surprised if you aren't already a part of it. This is this concept of integration. And integration, it, it's a busy space, meaning pretty much everything is connected to everything. So we're seeing the potential for new and, and evolved business models to manage their financial and extra financial, so financial and non-financial, something it's called, value creation in multiple directions. So that's looking up and down the supply chain, that's looking across the value network. There are so many different ways this is happening. It's almost like trying to put your fist in your mouth to explain it because it touches on so many elements. Um, again, I'll just cherry pick a couple places where we see this happening broadly and then uh, a particular company that I think is doing it. And in fact, they're an incumbent and I think they're doing it relatively well um, so broadly, I'm sure, well, I shouldn't assume because people are in different camps. Hopefully many of you are somewhat familiar with the integrated reporting movement that's underway and, and the International Integrated Reporting Council, the IIRC, is really pushing a lot of conversation and disclosure and reporting around uh, integration. It's more than reporting, so it's more than saying, you know, we do some stuff and it's connected to other stuff. It's also about genuinely understanding how different value is moving throughout the value chain. Um, potentially, again, playing that social note, maybe playing that lean note in the wider chord. Um, I think a company that's actually doing that in pretty innovative ways that is shifting how they create value and shifting how they deliver on social and environmental concepts and, and needs is a company called Fibria. They're a pulp company. They're in fact the world's largest soft pulp company, so a pretty big player out of Brazil. And they have been piloting integrated reporting for a number of years. Um, why does it matter? If you look at their work, uh, as an insider, you may look at some of their reporting and their infographics and your eyes may just cross. You might just be like, oh my god, this is so much information. It's insane. It's really interconnected. Their infographics are honestly, if you just Google Fibria and infographics and see what comes up, it's like, it seems chaotic. And then if you're, let's just take a moment if you can, take 20 moments and dive into one of their more complex infographics, one of the more recent ones, and you'll see that, first of all, they could not have put those things on the infographic if they didn't have the information. So they didn't just hire a, a communications company and say, can you do some cool graphics? You know, they actually, I know the people personally who did it, they actually hired somebody who specializes in data visualization and brought him inside the company and they facilitated a very, Anthony's got one up right now, that's actually one of their simpler ones. <laughs> I can guide you one of their crazy ones. Um, uh, I, I picked the one that was business models. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, <laughs> even more complex one of their business models. And they, they worked internally, cross-functionally, at a very senior level and at a grassroots level to understand what does the business do? Does it create positive or negative externalities? How do they know that? How do they measure that? Who have they told that and what did they say? And it's really complicated. You know, as I mentioned, they're the largest pulp producer in the world, so that's not a small undertaking. That's why the diagram is really busy. So um, the name of the company is Fibria, 
F I B R I A. I just I just put the link to the page on the website uh, with those uh, files that uh, Helena mentioned. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. For and and so when when we bring this concept of integration into the breakthrough business model universe, I think for a large incumbent like Fibria, it's not straightforward. I mentioned you know companies aren't having a meeting next Tuesday on how to rebuild their business model. But they are actively using integration to inform strategic decisions about what they do next, what they capitalize, and what they don't capitalize. And we're seeing this bear out. For example, they issued a green bond. Uh, I think it was the second green bond issued in Brazil uh, last fall. And they'll be using it to further investment in, uh, in, in basically what they do, which is they run tree plantations. Uh, another way to say that is they sequester carbon. Um, and not to suggest they're perfect, there are lots of things we could talk about around forestry and uh, the need to evolve in that sector as well. And they're listening. So it's, it's been quite interesting to see how integration has informed their business model. Lots more we could say there. Um, I'm going to just touch on two more and then see if there are questions or other examples before uh, shifting gears a little bit. So we played the, the social note, uh, we played the lean note and the integrated note. Uh, certainly, and it already came up uh, earlier before we started here, and I think Peter, you mentioned as well, the need for breakthrough business models to be circular. And uh, this is a really interesting one. The good news with this is we've already got perhaps more than social or this new take on lean. We've got more kind of industrial level examples to look at where we're seeing really exciting stuff play out. So to be clear about what this is, it's around really sustaining the inputs and outputs at their highest value. That's, that's more than recycling, it's more than upcycling, it's more than streaming waste, but those things can play a role and, and they're valuable considerations. Um, one of the things I'm finding most interesting about the circular examples that are catching my imagination, although I bet there are uh, many more, and I can certainly not keep up with this space, um, but I'm going to mention two quickly that in many ways seem to be serving the same purpose, but in different ways. So I, I find that kind of exciting that there's so many different ways to solve the same problems. The first one is a company called Novellus, and you might be familiar with Novellus. Um, in case not, it's Novellus has felt like novel, like a good book to read, and then IS at the end, Novellus. And nice Canadian note there is that they spun out of Alcan, which was, uh, of course, many of you know, former large uh, Canadian concern. Novellus spun out of Alcan, uh, now I'm forgetting time a little bit. I was going to say four years ago, so it was probably 10 years ago. Um, and they are an aluminum products company. They're one of the larger players in aluminum. They essentially uh, smelt, roll, and sell rolled aluminum to other businesses, so their, their customers would be like Ford or other automotive companies, it would be Apple or other electronics companies, uh, buildings, etc. And pop cans, so one of their biggest uh, markets is the, the beverage can um, value chain, if you will. And uh, Novellus, their CEO, who's actually no longer with the company, he, he might have actually been a little too strategic, uh, but he'll um, He'll, he certainly leaves an amazing legacy of an ambitious, so uh, his name is Phil Martins, a uh, very ambitious agenda to take the company to uh, upwards of 80% recycled raw material, going from mostly primary, uh, therefore mined alumina and bauxite and other raw materials to make aluminum, shifting to be 80% recycled. And why that matters so much, uh, there's huge energy implications to making metal from scratch, and there are huge social implications. So again, playing that little social note in the court, because when you recycle aluminum, you know, here in Toronto, we do it by using the blue box and putting it out by the curb and all those wonderful infrastructure systems we've had in place. When you do it in Brazil, you're engaging a part of the community that has very little access to the kinds of amenities we just take for granted. And so this kind of above ground mining um, Novellus isn't buying directly from these shadows in uh, Brazil, but what they are doing is creating an active and viable market for secondary materials, for recycled aluminum, which has, a, has an ongoing life. 
recycled aluminum has been around for a long time. This is not new, but a company saying we are going to actively source and shift our supply chain to being recycled aluminum. This is new. It's so new that it's kind of bumped into a few uh, barriers as they've gone. But they, they've uh, invested heavily in recycling facilities, which are very different in terms of the machinery required and the energy used than smelting facilities. So it's an exciting conversation. And then on the flip side of that, I mentioned there's another one that I think is solving the same challenge. It's much more in startup mode. Uh, it's another neat Canadian story, and some of you might be familiar with it, is um, Plastic Bank, which is also, the hashtag is social plastic. And they're, uh, I'm trying to find out more about them. So if anybody has an update or, or a contact, I'd love to learn more. Um, what we can see, and they've been around for a few years now, is that they're actively looking to, uh, they're most uh, focused on Haiti right now. They're working in um, developing economies with parts of the communities who are very poor and who have an opportunity to have a livelihood by collecting waste plastic and selling it into a recycling, uh, into a recycling stream. But it gets more interesting. It isn't just bring us your garbage and we'll pay you for it. They're using the blockchain as a technology to essentially create a trusted provenance of the supply chain of the plastic and it is labeled as social plastic. So that Unilever or Ikea or PepsiCo or name the large company who sources a great deal of plastic for their purchasing can select social plastic as they spec the product. So not only does that pull waste out of the system, out of the ocean, out of local rivers and waterways, it actively incentivizes companies who are looking to um, improve their own social impacts and uh, sort of labels and, and adds provenance to it. And so he's just pulling it up here and he's going to put the link in. Um, and, and one of the big missing challenges, and this we've heard as we explored the circular economy, um, we really noticed that uh, with a lot of these great ideas, there's a missing viable demand. So yeah, aluminum is recyclable and it's good stuff. And yeah, plastic, depending on the quality and how it's recycled, it, it could be used. But if there isn't a demand for these materials, it, it, the economics just don't work. So it's important to find ways to break through those barriers. And I think some of what Novellus is doing, some of what Plastic Bank is doing, that's really taking this circular characteristic and not just making it a cool idea, but looking at how to embed it into their, um, into their, literally their business models, how we create value. So that's the C tone. And the last one really overarches all of them. And I'll touch on what we mean when we say exponential. And this is coming up a lot. It was kind of funny when we were writing the report, all of a sudden, you know, we were talking about the law of attraction, uh, Ross, you know, when you mention something and all of a sudden you realize it's all around you. Uh, we're seeing this exponential concept in so many ways and, and so many places. It means a lot of different things to different people. It's kind of like innovation. You can interpret it in many ways. I'll, I'll put a bit of shape into how we interpret it. And then, uh, and then I'd love to open up the floor and have a little bit more discussion about what you're seeing and hearing. Um, and then a little bit more commentary for me about where I think we can go next. Um, so exponential, you know, it's a mathematical term. Um, we could we could just be boring and use the basic math of it. But I think what we're really trying to get at here is that this isn't about the incremental changes. This isn't change as usual. This is about really thinking big. How can we take this idea and and really multiply it by ten or beyond? You know, how can this be something that scales, that accelerates, that makes significant change. Um, my colleague Jacqueline Lim, one of the co-authors of this report, recently uh, published an article on Medium. The link is here. And I, I really appreciated her provocation around uh, you know, how do we Uberize the global goals. Everyone's talking about Uber. It has some very exponential characteristics. Uh, whether or not they're social, leaning, integrated, and circular, uh, certainly the social side, we could question it. And she brings some of that uh, I went onto the carpet to explore a little more. Um, but you know, we talk about unicorns. You hear this all the time. Who are these new unicorns that are going to um, uh, be exciting, highly valued startups? So, and, and the loose term for unicorns is a is a company that goes from startup to 
uh, to IPO at a billion dollars or above. And, and I've seen different definitions, but that's the one that seems to be easiest anyway to describe. And so this concept of new unicorns, not just companies that IPO for a billion dollars, but that solve a billion people's problems or that have a positive impact on a billion people. And, and I'll, I'll take you through a couple of visuals that will remind us that this, this really is happening in a lot of places. It's not impossible. Um, and if we apply that kind of exponential lens as we're either crafting new businesses or we're working with other companies who are existing business models to think about how they can shift their own thinking. And if you spent any time working with John, you know that he, he's like the king of frameworks. He loves a good framework. And he had been sort of penning a few things on the back of an envelope as we were uh, thinking about this conversation, and uh, where he uh, sort of described the, the exponential conversation, if you want to map it. And hopefully the colors come up OK for folks, and what the numbers might be hard to read. But on the horizontal axis, uh, we're really just talking about um, the kinds of uh, uh, how can we put this? Actually, you know what? I'm, I'm going to apologize because this is a version that does not have uh, the axis labeled correctly. It's really meant to be the kind of change. So is it really sort of positive change all the way on the right, or is it uh, really either neutral or, or potentially negative change on the left? And sorry, that's those that old labels. On the vertical axis, you've got the number of people that you're impacting. Is it just a few people, or are we really getting into that exponential mode? And so what we see on the bottom left is you've got the sort of business as usual. Like, this is our business model. We create financial value. We report quarterly. We, we leap from quarterly lily pad to quarterly lily pad, and that's that. There's some really cool stuff going on, even in that bottom right-hand quadrant, which is change as usual. You know, good things are happening. Um, positive increments. Glad to see it. Wouldn't want to stop it, but it's really not going to be what we need. And in that upper left, uh, to the question earlier, you know, that's when that line <laughs> really points us in the wrong direction, where we're, we think we're an airplane following aerodynamic laws, but actually we're not. And, and that's not really where we'd like to go. And breakthrough is, is some of what we've been talking about as we've gone through these notes. Um, there are so many ways we could slice and dice these characteristics. You know, this is a this is a song uh, that you've probably heard many times before in different ways with different characteristics. I do have some remarks about what we're seeing emerging in terms of what's going to keep informing this and, and where to from here that I'd love to share with you. But I'd also just like to pause and, and take your temperature around. Are we missing some uh, some really great examples that you think would be worth sharing, um, or other reflections or comments on what I've been uh, pushing at you so far? And over to Anthony to moderate because I'm not sure if you've seen. I haven't seen anybody uh, typing any questions, but if you, if uh, folks online would like to uh, type some questions or put your hands up using the functionality in Adobe, we can take questions that way. Um, I'll, I'll, while well, that's waiting, and before I call the room, I'm going to ask one question. Uh, do, do you think those, those uh, I, I love the metaphor, the musical metaphor is just absolutely fantastic. Um, do you think that those notes in that scale and all the songs that you can play, uh, composed with those notes, uh, do you think that that's necessary and sufficient? Mm. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Yeah. How, how, how complete? Yeah. Can I actually, in all sincerity, can I not answer that question for a few minutes? Sure. Um, there's something that I think you'll see okay. why when I put okay. it up. But I love that question. I think we should ask. I want to ask myself that question. So okay. I get the start of every day. Okay. Uh, is okay. it necessary and sufficient? Uh, Paul. Yeah, this is great. <clears throat> I, I really uh, appreciate the overview, especially of the slice. Um, but building on, on uh, Anthony's question, um, you know, how would we how would we know it was sufficient? How would we yeah. how would we assess that? And it really gets into metrics, which you hinted at a bit when you talked about the lean and the yeah. the integrated reporting approach towards using capitals and so on, and trying to assess the extent to which the capitals. Uh, interplay and create value in different ways over the period of a particular time frame. But the, the, the elephant in the room around all of these things is metrics. It's, uh, the, yeah. The, uh, people could say, we're, we're doing all of those things in the slice. 
You say, oh, really? Um, and they've got a story behind every one of those letters. But you say, well, yeah, but, you know, there's, there's got to be a, a better way to craft the, um, the way in which we could tell whether these are truly breakthrough, truly future fit, truly whatever business models that are going to get us out of that, that downward wave that you were describing before. And yeah. how, the heck do, how the heck do we, how do we bait the hook properly so that uh, there is a, a genuine desire by companies to make that transformation voluntarily? Yeah, you know, maybe I'll um, maybe I'll do my job better here and, and take you through a real answer because I, I do think that that is the question, and and we've talked a lot about future fit and you know and and what's there and and if I may I, I'd actually like to just cycle us through what I think gets at that I, I I don't have the formula for it but I've got some observations around what I see emerging and I guess I would say. Um, <laughs> My expectations around that are shifting in terms of what, what I need to do about that. Because I think until recently I, I was thinking more like, why don't we just, you know, why don't we sign up for the right initiative or why don't we agree to the right metrics? And what I'm realizing is we we know what we need to do a lot of the time, right? And we still make poor decisions. And I saw somewhere on the side panel there. Um, something around embedding things into day-to-day -day decisions. And I, I think that's quite right. And I think it's connected to more things. So if I can go a little avant-garde and with a nod to my husband who's from a musical background of avant-garde music, I'm going to be a bit dissonant and play a, a whole different chord here. So bear with me for just a moment. And I've got a quote up here that hopefully you've been taking in. I'm just going to just skim through a couple things. So we already noticed we're here. Um, just, just before you go there, I'd like to pick up on Stephen's earlier comment and to connect it to this and to what Bob has just said. I mean, this is an area where we've done some very initial work on what we've been calling design principles. Uh -huh. So, uh, as, as Bob and I have discussed on several occasions, um, it's great to have the measurements, but unless you understand what you did in the business model operations when, it, when it's operating to create those outcomes, Often the metrics actually don't help you figure out what to change mm -hmm. and how to change it. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. sitting, sitting as we are in a design school, one of the things we're very interested in seeing if we can capture those design principles. Now, at the moment, we're at, on being uh, Hodorum and myself are actively using Future Fit and the cooperative uh, principles and um, the uh, Business Alliance Local Living Economy Local Economy Framework principles to guide entrepreneurs into making better decisions mm -hmm. about the design of their business models. Yeah. But we also know that this is a very um, blunt instrument as far as design principles are concerned, and there's quite a lot more work that's, that's required. But it's an area that we're keen to do more work on, uh, and, and it has to be there for the effective use of tools like the Flourishing Business Canvas. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make that connect, connect some dots there. And, and Stephen, thank you for highlighting the design principles active earlier. Yeah, yeah it's, and it's a, it's a great call out. I think one of the things that's missing in a lot of cases is knowledge. right? So you folks bring a set of knowledge to be able to call that out. And then there needs to be coming from different sides and different angles the ability to plug in where things are missing. Like, do they have sufficient data to even answer the questions? And you know, I'm putting something up. I, I think this, yeah, this is the slide I have up now with this view bend. I'll, so this is where things go a little dissonant. You know, we go a little bit into the realm of uh, noisy pots and pans falling on the floor because. Um, you know, if any of you have bumped into Theory U, or maybe you've experienced it without knowing you were in Theory U, you know, we're going through a place where we're, we're perceiving things that were understood to be normal are actually not okay. Mm -hmm. And we're at, at least I'm at, the place right around that dot right in the middle, which is letting go of what's not working and trying to create what doesn't exist yet. So it's a really messy space, and it's hard to define. I think many of the tools you're describing, and I'm going to try to flash a few more before you, um, are, are starting to fill those dots in. And we need to keep asking and searching and where they're not quite right. And I think that the sustainability industry, you know, I, we had this up here. This is where we've been born into the wrong paradigm. 
we, us, the people trying to solve these problems, have to let go of some of what we thought the solutions were. And, and I probably don't even know the half of what those things are yet. In fact, I look at the sustainable development goals, and I like them a lot. You know, they're the future I want. We've got these 17 goals. But they're more than tiny boxes, right? Yeah, yeah. They're more than a list. We've got this great list. Here are those same goals. Organize this list. Great, I've got a list. This is my to-do list to create the future we want. But let's be real here. There are 17 of them. They're kind of a little bit all over the place. Every single one of them is interconnected. Oh, yeah. And there's 169 targets to these totally interconnected goals. And, and I'm going to get up in the morning as a sustainability consultant and ask a company to pay me to tell them what to do. And I'm going to give you an even more. The, the, the next thing is that those 169 goals aren't aligned with each other, and in many cases aren't aligned with the science right. as per the ecological economy. So this is why we've been saying it's, we need to get to the sustainable development goals and beyond yes. to flourishing, because this yeah. is not, yeah. and we're not even sure that this is even necessary. Yeah, yeah, or well, we know it's not sufficient. And let's say we also put ourselves in the middle of the goals, as opposed to in a web of life. But let's say we think they're at least a reasonable place to hover and a business to move. You can pick one of those targets, and I'm cherry sure picked of the 169 target 4.7, which, by the way, is a goal about all the other goals. <laughs> right? And it's a really good goal. But if you said, I work in the field of education, Goal 4 is pretty focused on education, I want to help a company that, let's remember, this is about business models, this is about value creation. I want to help a company create value by delivering on the target that helps everybody around the world acquire the skills required to live sustainably, which is essentially what this one's getting at. Wow, you know, these goals that everyone signed on to and every company is reporting on uh, are actually super interconnected and complex. So I think we have to hold them in context, even though that's where business is going right now. This, again, this is the world we've been born into. This is the world we created. And I think we have to think really hard about what do we do with this world, because we've made it a little messy and complicated. Very much your point. So some of the thinking that we're tinkering with at Bullens and realizing we don't have nearly enough time to crack this whole map, but I'll share some of what we see coming out, emerging. Love to talk to you more. Love to hear what we're missing. Tweet it at us or, or pull me aside. Um, and, and first of all, I'm just going to flash this to say, remember that really serious, significant change does happen, and it happens quickly. 20 years ago, Google was an idea in a dorm room, and a year later, there had been 10,000 queries per day on Google. Last night, when I was finalizing this, there had already been 5 billion queries. So do that math in under 20 years and remind yourself that whatever's going on in the dorm rooms of OCAD right now could easily, in fact, probably within fewer than 20 years, have a kind of social lean, integrated, circular, and exponential impact that we can barely imagine. How are they going to do it? They're going to change the way they think about carbon. I'm flashing this in front of you. I beg you to spend time going to Bill McDonough's site. It is imperfect and evolving. I, I think of this as one step in another probably infinite array we need to make, but it's already shifting, getting us away from just talking about emissions and GHGs and carbon bad, and helping us see that carbon is an element. It's in us, it's all around us. We need to change basics about how we understand the world around us. We need, to Bob's point, and yours, and we need to measure things differently. We need to understand what does success actually look like, and how do we measure our progress towards it. And my favorite thing about future fit maybe two favorite things. One is this concept of system value, which I know you guys have explored. And the other thing I absolutely cherish about it, I think is underplayed, maybe you guys could con contemplate a different colorway to help us get there. This helps place us in the web of life. This is an underplayed aspect of the work we do. We're not doing this because we want to make money. We're not doing this because we're savvy entrepreneurs. Maybe those are parts of it, but I'm doing this because I see myself as one among many, and not just one among many people, but one living creature among many on, a, on the only planet that sustains life as I know it. So we need those new metrics. We need to adopt them. We need new maps. This is a snapshot from an open source free tool called KUMU, K-U-M-U. Again, the, the link is in the um, deck here. Some nice person named Robert Newell, maybe you guys know him, um, took some time to map the, what it looks like every, there's probably more, organization in Canada that's working to make the company, the country more environmentally savvy. It's free. You can click on any one of these and go to the website. 
This tool didn't exist a couple years ago. It exists now. The manifesto of the folks who started Kumo built it so that people could solve challenging problems. It exists. We're building a map at Hollands to map the carbon universe. It's going to be open source shortly. We can solve problems. We're smart people. Give us the tools. We'll do it. These things are emerging. New models. I love what the natural step is doing with their labs. I think what they're doing with the Energy Futures Lab is super exciting. Would you call this a business model? I don't know. I'm not too concerned with the label is. But it's definitely business, and there's definitely some models. They are actively innovating to change the way in which Alberta and other parts of the world create energy, create value, and do other things that will actually be super, super positive for this country. Again, so, so I'm going to observe it's aligned business models across the value system. Uh -huh. it's, the, it's the output in modeling. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And I think from what I know of it, and I've chatted with Chad Park and others, it's not perfect, right? Like these are not like, oh, they thought the model, go go copy them. Yeah. But it's emergent properties of a new system that we may may seek to push. We need new markets. This is probably, in my humble opinion, the biggest missing link. New places that actually incentivize and drive these changes. Green bonds are beginning. They're imperfect. We're seeing others. Volans, I mentioned off the top, one of the projects that Volans is actively uh, enabling in uh, partnership with the UN Global Compact is Project Breakthrough. And through this, and this is all open, the link is here, and the hashtag is Project Breakthrough. We are featuring elements of breakthrough, either a business model and entire business or some other initiative or activity or person. There's some really inspirational people out there. And so we're trying to feature some of these new markets and elements of this new way of thinking because in order for it to be not just, um, you know, it, is it sufficient? Is it enough? I think we have to really push ourselves from all angles. And I mean, I can push myself, I can challenge myself. What do I really not understand yet? And who can help me understand it? So much more we could talk about. Um, I'm just going to pause and turn it over to Anthony to tell me what I should be talking about and, and make sure there's a little bit more time for uh, questions and, and discussion. I'm putting a couple of questions up here, but you may have others you want to So I'm, I'm cognizant that I think at your last talk, we didn't take any questions in the room. So ask some questions in the room and then go online to see if there's more questions. So if you have questions online, type or put your hand up. Um, Blockchain is something that came up for me on the weekend, and I just started to noodle on it. But the idea of tracking the provenance of products, it kind of is revolutionary because you can apply that to organic food, to clothing, paying back manufactured goods. And really has to validate that it's come from made in a sustainable way. So can you maybe expand on what, who's working in that area? Or? Well, you know, one of your national treasures and leading thought leaders on the blockchain is right here in Toronto, Don Tapscott. Okay, yeah, and what's interesting, article, yeah. I don't know Don well, but I'm guessing at least a few folks in the room have had a chance to interact with him. And I first bumped into him in a sustainability context. So I love that someone who was of the sustainability universe has migrated into the blockchain universe, like migrate away. Um, just two quick things on blockchain. One is we actually go we case study a company called Provenance okay. um, in the report, and they're doing exactly what you're describing. And they're in startup mode, so a couple years ago, so it'll be interesting to see that they go and they're using the blockchain. Uh, the second thing I'd say is I feel like the blockchain technology has the possibility to unlock so much of what we're trying to do, and it has the possibility to unlock some really yucky stuff. Oh, yes. So um, I feel like like any tool, you know, a little bit is in a lot is in how you use it. But anybody I've often that knows anything about blockchain blows my mind with the possibilities. So I'd say the smarter we get on these technologies and others like big data, analytics, things like that, I think start to move us in a direction we need to go. Was there a question? Somebody's typing. On uh, Dean, do you have a question? It says you're typing. Maybe not. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. I was just connecting the microphone. Um, I guess I can stop typing. Um, I think one of the things that we are are seeing quite predominantly in the work that we're doing with uh, startups and uh, entrepreneurs is that one of the, the key drivers of business model innovation is actually the competencies of those designing and building these business models. 
And it actually has... Can you just get a little closer to your microphone? You're very quiet. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's much that's better. better. Oh, okay, cool. Um, did you get any of what I said? Please start again. I, I think, I, um, start again. You, you, yeah, start again. I think it'll be better. Um, in the work that we're doing at Lean for Flourishing with startups and uh, entrepreneurs, one of the things that we're seeing is one of the most influential aspects of business model innovation is, in fact, the competencies required of those trying to implement them or design them. And that a lot of these competencies, which we're calling now flourishing competencies, and we're in the very early stages of, um, of um, exploring them, most business leaders, as well as entrepreneurs, don't have. So it's a whole new way of being able to do business. And so this is a huge gap uh, that we're seeing in, in looking at building out um, a flourishing competency model to help us distinguish what are those things that we need to build in leaders of the future in order to bring about these, these new and innovative business models. Brilliant. Yeah, that reminds me of um, last Monday I was facilitating a roundtable at Columbia University on behalf of a foundation that wants to incentivize tax cuts for green bonds. And it was a fascinating conversation. The intention was brilliant, right? Wouldn't it be great if there were more green bonds? How can we make that work? It's actually a, a foundation that is very involved in a very right-wing, sort of big C conservative universe. And they see that conservatives in the US are not very open to that green conversation. So they're looking at how to you know, shift the tax policy, et cetera. It was a great conversation, very interesting, but it struck me that even those who really wanted to see it work did not have, as you're describing it, um, I believe it's on Dean, around the um, competency to even understand the bigger picture of what we're trying to get at, You know that this is a wider web of life, that there are real planetary boundaries at work. This isn't just a debate about policy and trying to win the vocabulary and you know, convince the conservatives to sign on to something green. So, it struck me that even the general framing in the room missed some of the basic competencies required to make good decisions that are already challenging enough. I, I love that idea. Is that something you, you folks are, are putting together and, and, and looking out in the world, or is this sort of um, something? How does that work? Uh, so it's, it's um, part of the lean flourishing work to bring flourishing thinking into the startup world um, based on Dean's research and leveraging the flourishing business standards. So we're, we're taking a very first initial version to startups, entrepreneurs at CSI at the moment in the accelerator we're running. Awesome. And uh, we're looking to build a community of um, uh, encouraging, uh, encouragers, so organizations who are helping startups, accelerators, incubators, hubs, etc., cetera, um, to co-develop this model with us. Uh, awesome. But it's particularly focused on the entrepreneurial competencies for flourishing. Right. That's great. That was a neat, neat initiative. I'm really glad to hear that. On the did I miss anything? And, and in terms of where we are in the world, so we, I, I would say the, um, it's, it's, we think it's a differentiator for what the infrastructure is doing, uh, but we also know that this is something we're doing to help the world. So we're mm -hmm. working our way through that. Um, if, if there's no other questions, I had one uh, other observation back to your theory review uh, comment. So um, this is actually also because of the work that I'm doing with Ondine, um, that um, I, I think it certainly wasn't there originally. So at some point, Otto Sharma added um, the opposite of the U, the N, um, on the top. I've got it on the, my laptop here. Yeah, and so um, the op this is to describe the absence of presencing, which he calls absence. <laughs> um, and um, one of the observations is that um, that Otto makes is that there are a whole bunch of voices that tend to drive you from presencing to absencing. Mm -hmm. Things like voice of judgment, voice of cynicism, voice of fear, and that those can happen moment to moment. Mm -hmm. So I think part of what you were describing is this flipping that's going on between presencing and absencing as we see different things in the world. Um, and it's the voice of judgment, cynicism, and fear that flips you into the other mode, mode of thinking. And in our work, we, we've realized that there's actually a, a, another set of things that you can do if you're absencing, if you recognize, if you're listening to yourself and you recognize the relative sin, 
you can actually get yourself back to presence in if you think about the voice of joy, the voice of abundance, and the voice of tolerance. So this is, we have to talk to Otto about adding this to the model because we've just come up with this. But we think that if, if you're really listening to yourself, you probably can't stop yourself from flipping up and feeling low. But at least you've now got some ways of getting yourself back faster. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think when you're talking about that you, um, what's going on for you is, is you're flipping between the two. Maybe it's theory O. Maybe it's theory O. Oh, there you go, maybe. maybe. And I'm, I'm mindful of your time. Yes. And I want to just, Bob, I see a question there. If I can, just in closing, I'll, yes. I'll reflect on the question and, and with thanks. Because I think, so Bob is just, I think you folks see, can, can I give examples of the missing flourishing competencies? And I guess what I would reflect um, when I think of many conversations I've had with companies, and most of my work is with large companies, sometimes with fairly senior folks in companies, I'll be totally honest and say a lot of what we're talking about here is crazy talk. Right? So the missing competency, Bob, is like openness to crazy talk. Um, and so that's, and that's actually a judgmental thing I'm saying about other people. Perhaps the missing competency for me is the ability to take the awareness, the presence, the, the belief in the opportunity to thrive in a different way than we do today, and to translate it into something that's meaningful and compelling to folks who, aren't, who haven't yet had the opportunity to think that way, who haven't had permission to, who haven't been incentivized to. So the competency challenge for me is to look for those bridges, those linguistic cues, those personality traits, you know, to play the notes in the right order, um, or to simply bypass those who don't have that energy and, and ability or overall at the moment. And then the competency on the other side of the boardroom table or the networking opportunity, as such as it is, is quite often, frankly, a fundamental awareness of the scope and the nature of the challenges and the existing solutions that are already out there, the, the templates that so many are building and sharing open source the way folks like FutureFit, Kumu, and others are doing. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you very much for your attention and amazing questions and, uh, and ideas and invite further, and, and especially if you've got ideas or advice for how I can increase my competency and pass through to you and up into the, um, the other good parts and go around the O. And I uh, look forward to, to keeping in touch and hearing what you folks build and, uh, and create going forward. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Lorraine. I'm going to uh, just wrap up very quickly by saying thank you again. That was, just, that was tremendous. That's uh, really excellent presentation, very thought-provoking, really interesting research. Um, really delighted that you were able to be here in person. So thank you very much. Um, in terms of some next steps, um, I, I think I would like to encourage everybody, because I know I can't be the only one with some next steps on my mind in terms of things that uh, we should uh, consider. But uh, I'd like to direct people to the um, comments underneath this month's meeting. So I'm about to post the link to the presentation, the slides, and also to the recording of today's meeting there. But I encourage you, if you've got ideas that you would like to see us explore, or that you would like to lead the exploration of, uh, with Lorraine or with other members of the SSBNG, um, then please put them there and then we can look at those and see what is emerging and then perhaps have an, a, 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 a meeting between our meetings to see what uh, we might like to do about any of that in our normal mode of how we start new things in the, in the group. And uh, I, I think we've just found some, um, some kindred spirits with, <laughs> with you guys, so uh, ho hopefully we'll be able to uh, bring that in uh, at the same time. So as I said, please put comments in the LinkedIn post. It's the first post in the group at the moment because uh, it's pinned at the top and it will be like that for another three weeks. So uh, let's have an active conversation there. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. I'm going to end the recording now. Thanks, guys. And see you in a month's time. Or I should say next month we also have a treat. Uh, we have Nancy Boken who will be talking to us about an update on her research on patterns of sustainable business models. This is an update from work she uh, presented to us uh, three years ago now. And she's also got a new book out, which is also about uh, circular value co-creation, uh, all topics of uh, key interest to us all here. So I think it's going to be another great presentation next month. And I'll also announce tentatively the month afterwards, uh, yeah, no, not tentatively, the month after us, we have uh, Dr. Florian Ludek Freud and um, Henning Brewer, who are talking about their latest work on uh, not only patterns, but also on uh, some tools around business modeling. And the month after that, we have, uh, I'm delighted,
be able to announce that we have uh, Daniel Christian Wall, uh, the, the author of the new um, design, uh, Designing Flourishing Cultures. I'm not quite getting the title of that book correct, correctly, uh, but he'll be speaking, we hope, in uh, June. I've got the date, June or July. So, uh, packed uh, good uh, speaking coming up, so we to seeing you all uh, at future meetings. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs>